Hi folks, I'm Johnny and welcome to The Oddest. Today I've got three incredible stories that you will not believe are true. So, without further ado, let's get into it. The year was 1957 and Larry Bader was just an ordinary guy living in Akron, Ohio with his wife Mary Lou and their three children. He loved his family and always did his best to take care of them. However, Larry had a bit of a rough go when it came to business. He tried his hand at several different ventures over the years, but none of them panned out, leaving the family in a heap of debt. So, he had to suck it up and take a job as a cookware salesman for a local company just to make ends meet. Whilst the job paid the bills, it didn't exactly light a fire under Larry's belly. On the weekends when Larry wasn't working, and with the approval of his wife, he would take off to go fishing at Lake Erie, which was about an hour's drive north of where they lived. One Friday, March 15th to be exact, Larry went to his wife and asked if he could head up to the lake to fish for the weekend. She was hesitant, warning him about the bad weather that was pending, but ultimately she gave him the green light. Larry waved off her concerns, telling her that the weather reports are always overblown and not to worry. He said goodbye to his family, loaded up his gear, hopped in his truck and hit the road towards Lake Erie that night. Lake Erie was hit with a massive thunderstorm, much bigger than what the news had predicted. The next morning, the Coast Guard found Larry's boat floating on the water. The boat was slightly damaged and was missing an oar, but Larry was nowhere to be found. A search was immediately underway and launched for Larry, but he was never found. Eventually, he was declared dead, and even though his body was never discovered, his family held a funeral for him. Luckily, his wife was able to collect on his life insurance policy, which was enough to take care of her and the kids. Fast forward eight years to 1965, when Larry Bader's 21-year-old niece, Suzanne Paker, was at a sporting goods show in Chicago with a friend. As they walked around checking out all of the different exhibits on show, they noticed a large crowd had gathered in one particular exhibit at the side of the building. Well, they wanted to know what was going on, so they pushed their way through the crowd to get a closer look. In the middle of the group, there was a man wearing an eye patch and he had a big moustache performing an archery demonstration. He was shooting arrows into a target about 30 feet away. As Suzanne and her friend watched the man's impressive archery skills, they couldn't help but notice that he was drawing a large crowd. It was clear to them that he was an incredible archer. He was hitting bullseye over and over again. However, Suzanne's friend began to notice something unique about this guy. Her friend turned to her and said, Hey, doesn't this guy look exactly like your uncle that went missing on Lake Erie? Suzanne was taken aback by this comment, but as she looked at the man, she suddenly saw it too. He was the spitting image of Larry Bader, her missing uncle. Despite the man's distinguishing features, namely his impressive moustache and eye patch, Suzanne, she just couldn't shake off the feeling that he really did look like her uncle Larry, even down to his incredible archery skills. After the demonstration was over, Suzanne and her friend rushed over to the man with the eye patch. Suzanne gathered the courage to approach him and said, Hey, I know this sounds totally crazy, but you look exactly like my uncle Larry Bader. He went missing on Lake Erie eight years ago. The guy heard her and he flashed a smile. Hey there, I'm really sorry, but I don't know Larry Bader. My name is John Johnson, but folks around here call me Fritz. I can't be much help, I'm afraid. Meanwhile, Suzanne kept her gaze locked on him, and the more that she looked, the more she was absolutely convinced that this was her Uncle Larry. No, no, she insisted. You are Larry Bader. I'm sure of it. Fritz maintained his polite yet firm demeanour. I'm really sorry, but I'm not your uncle, and I have no idea who Larry Bader is. I don't even go to Lake Erie. I live in Omaha, Nebraska with my wife and children. I work as a sports journalist and also consult for archery companies. He shook his head in disbelief. I just don't understand why you think I'm your uncle, but I'm sorry, I'm really not him. With that, Fritz turned round and walked away. However, 
Suzanne and her friend were not swayed in the slightest by his denial. They were convinced that Fritz was indeed Larry Bader. Suzanne and her friend rushed to a nearby payphone, and Suzanne called her two other uncles who were Larry Bader's brothers. She excitedly explained how she met this guy who looked exactly like their long-lost brother. Without a moment's hesitation, they caught a flight to Chicago that very night. The next morning, they headed straight to the sporting goods show where Fritz was giving another impressive archery demonstration. As soon as there was a break, Suzanne, her friend and the two uncles made their way over to the archery exhibit. And, just like Suzanne and her friend, the two uncles immediately recognised Fritz, despite his eye patch and moustache, and they declared, this is our brother. The three of them approached Fritz, and one of the uncles said, look, we know that you keep saying that you're not our brother, but you do look exactly like him. We have his military paperwork with his fingerprints right here. Would you please do us this favour and come with us to the police station and get fingerprinted so we can confirm that you're not our brother? You see, we've been searching for him for a very long time and this would mean the world to us and our family. Fritz was clearly annoyed, but he agreed begrudgingly. Okay, fine, I'll go with you to the police station. We'll get my fingerprints taken and then we can put this whole thing behind us. So, after leaving the sporting goods show, they went straight to the police station where Fritz's fingerprints were taken. Obviously, he was a good man and just wanted to be done with this sh silly shenanigans and he hoped for an apology from these strangers that they were insistent that he was this Larry Bader guy. A short time later, the results from the fingerprints came through. He was Larry Bader. Fritz couldn't believe this. This revelation didn't bring back any forgotten memories or prompt any new recollections. Instead, it left Fritz questioning everything about his life. Were all of his memories a lie? Did he really grow up as Fritz Johnson? Or was that all just a facade? He tried to recall anything from his childhood, but nothing came to him. All he had were his memories from the last eight years, which he knew were now not his real memories. Larry Bader's story is a bit of a mystery, but as far as we know, Fritz Johnson showed up in Omaha, Nebraska not long after Larry went missing on Lake Erie. Fritz didn't waste any time, he just walked into a restaurant and asked for a job. He had some paperwork to prove that he was Fritz Johnson, and nobody thought twice about it. Over time, Fritz made himself at home in Omaha. He got hitched, he had a kid, adopted another one, and even landed a sweet gig as a sports TV broadcaster. Everyone in Omaha knew Fritz. He was a local celebrity. People would say, hey there Fritz Johnson, he's on TV. And he'd wave and say, howdy. It was like he'd been living there forever. As soon as the news hit that it wasn't Fritz Johnson, but actually Larry Bader, his life fell apart. The TV station that he worked for gave him the boot. His second wife, who he thought he was legally married to, took off. Turns out he was still legally married to his first wife and their marriage was the real deal. As if that wasn't enough, the insurance company that paid out the policy to his first wife demanded all the money back. Through all the drama, Fritz kept denying that he was Larry Bader. He just couldn't wrap his head around it. None of it made any sense to him. So, a group of experts, including doctors and psychologists, went to Omaha to test Fritz, aka Larry Bader, for almost two weeks. After running a battery of tests, they concluded that Fritz was indeed Larry Bader and that he was probably suffering from an extreme case of amnesia. However, the experts had no clue as to how he developed his condition, and Fritz was equally clueless about it. It was all a mystery. It looks like we might never truly understand what happened to Larry Bader. Unfortunately, just one year after it was discovered that Fritz was Larry, he passed away due to cancer in his eye. That's actually why he used to wear the eye patch. It's really sad, but his story continues to be one of the most fascinating and puzzling cases of amnesia that there is. It was June 10th, 1994. Deborah Hoyt had been sound asleep until she suddenly jolted awake in the wee hours of the morning. She and her husband were visiting family in Sacramento, California, and had planned to stay there for a few days. As she sat there in bed, something felt off. 
an intense urge to leave and to return home in Lake Tahoe washed over her, leaving her feeling confused and restless. What could be causing this sudden feeling of unease? Deborah couldn't shake the nagging sensation that something was about to happen. Deborah shook her husband awake, determined to act on her gut feeling. She explained her unease, but he just dismissed it and said it was a bad dream. He told her, go back to sleep, and assured her that everything was fine, offering to leave in the morning if she still felt the same way. Deborah agreed, thinking that maybe he was right and she was just overreacting. But as she lay in bed, the feeling of dread grew stronger and stronger until she couldn't ignore it any longer. She jumped out of bed and told her husband they needed to leave immediately. He was hesitant at first, but eventually relented and agreed to leave. Deborah didn't know what was wrong, but she just knew she had to trust her instincts. So they hastily packed their bags and left a note for their relatives before setting off. The drive back there was treacherous, especially when they hit Bullion Bend, a winding mountainous road where one misstep could send them hurtling down and off the side of a cliff. About 15 minutes into the drive, they rounded a sharp turn and Deborah, sitting in the passenger seat, spotted something off the side of the road up ahead. At first she thought it might be a bag, or some garbage, or even a dead animal, but as they drew closer, the light revealed something lying on the ground, and she couldn't quite make out what it was. As they drove closer, Deborah realised with a jolt that it was in fact a woman's body, laying motionless by the side of the road. She turned to her husband and in a trembling voice told him what she had seen. He panicked, unsure of what to do, but kept driving, asking if they should stop and see if they could help. Deborah was adamant. She didn't want to take the risk of stopping. What if it was a trap set by someone who wanted to lure them and attack them? No, they had to keep driving. Deborah and her husband found themselves in a chaotic situation, unsure of what to do next. After some discussion, they decided to continue driving until they found the next payphone to call the police. Luckily, they stumbled upon a ranger station with a phone just a quarter of a mile away. Deborah wasted no time to make the call. The cops told them both to wait in the car and they'll be there soon. They also said that they'll need Deborah and her husband to show them the exact spot where they saw the female body. Within a few minutes, the police arrived and instructed Deborah and her husband to drive back up the road, but to stop about 200 yards before the location of where they saw the woman. Deborah knew exactly where the woman's body was, and they stopped on the side of the road just before a sharp turn. The police pulled up alongside them, and Deborah indicated that the body was just laying around the corner on the left-hand side. Deborah and her husband sat in the car anxiously watching as the police headed up the road and out of sight around the corner. They could see the police spotlights moving around on the other side, presumably looking for the body. After what felt like an eternity, the police returned and stopped next to Deborah's car. They delivered the shocking news that they found nothing up there. Deborah insisted that she was telling the truth and that she saw a woman's body laying on the side of the road. Despite believing her, the police were unable to find any evidence to support her claim. With no other options, the police told Deborah and her husband to head home, leaving them to grapple with the mystery of what had just happened. After Deborah and her husband left, the two responding officers drove back to the police station. They were still thinking about what happened in the strange turn of events. Inside, they couldn't help but speculate about what Deborah might have seen. As they were discussing, Another officer, Rich Strasser, overheard them and asked about what happened. The officers recounted how Deborah claimed to have seen a dead woman's body up on Bullion Bend. Upon hearing the location, Rich remembered that they had received a missing persons report for a Christine Skubish and her young son Nick, who were last seen on Bullion Bend just a few days ago. Rich couldn't shake off the feeling that there might be a dead body up there on that bend possibly belonging to Christine. The thought kept him up all that night, and he eventually decided to go and check it out the next morning. So, he woke up bright and early and made his way to Bullion Bend, the exact spot where Deborah had claimed to have seen this lifeless body. As he arrived, he noticed a child's shoe lying on the road. He pulled over, stepped out of his vehicle, and picked up the shoe. His eyes darted around, searching for any other signs of anything out of the ordinary. But the road was empty, there were no skid marks, no debris, no other clothes, 
just this one child's shoe. As Rich approached the guardrail overlooking the steep embankment, he peered down the other side. At first, all he saw were trees covering the mountainside. However, as he scanned the area, he noticed what appeared to be more clothing scattered further down the slope. Curiosity getting the better of him, Rich climbed over the guardrail and carefully made his way down the mountain. Within seconds, he came upon a clearing amidst the branches and the trees. From there, he could see a level terrain with a red four-door sedan that had been badly smashed up. It was the same make and model of car that Christine Skubish had been driving when she disappeared a few days ago. Without hesitating, Rich raced down the mountain following the scattered debris, and it led him straight to the car. He circled around to the driver's side, and there she was, Christine Skubish lifeless in the driver's seat. Sitting next to her was her son Nicky, who was barely hanging on after going without food or water for around five days. Doctors would later confirm that Nicky only had one or two hours left to live if Rich had not found him at that moment. Authorities concluded that Christine had likely fallen asleep at the wheel, causing her to drive off the embankment. At first, Rich thought that Deborah might have seen Christine whilst driving through the mountains and witnessing the woman on the side of the road. After her accident, Christine likely crawled out of the car and climbed all the way up the embankment hoping someone would spot her. When no one stopped, she would have made her way back down to the car where she ultimately passed away. However, according to the coroner, this would have been impossible because Christine had died instantly on impact five days ago. That was five days before Deborah saw the woman on the side of the road. To this day, nobody knows for sure who or what Deborah saw on that side of the road. The mystery remains unsolved. It is a fact that Rich only found Nikki alive because of Deborah's police report about the dead woman on the side of the road. Deborah was only on that road because of a strange middle of the night urge to leave her relative's house and drive up into the mountains, something that she had never felt before and couldn't explain. This all seems like an extremely strange set of circumstances, but some might say that Nicky had a guardian angel watching over him. On February 17th, 2004, a 68-year-old man went into an ATM to withdraw money from the Jusko shopping centre in Yokaichi City, Miyet Prefecture in Japan. It was a typical errand that he probably had done many times before. However, this simple action would ultimately end in tragedy. This is the true unsolved mystery of the Jusko Phantom. Just in case you're not familiar with Japanese store brands, Jusko, which was later renamed to Aeon, was a large shopping centre that contained everything from grocery stores to clothing stores and various restaurants and 100 yen shops. These are like pound shops here in the UK or dollar stores in the States. Just like most of these types of establishments, Jusco also had ATM corners available for shoppers to withdraw cash. An elderly gentleman with both hands occupied with shopping bags went to withdraw money from an ATM at this Jusco shopping centre, but he wasn't alone. Loitering around the ATM corner was a young woman. She was cradling a baby in a chest harness. She had been hanging around the area for about five minutes before the man showed up, keeping a watchful eye. As the man began to leave the ATM area after withdrawing whatever amount of money he had, the woman approached him. She acted as though she intended to walk past him, but purposefully bumped into his shoulder. And then, without warning, the woman eerily ran her fingers across the man's chest. The man was left standing there, shocked and confused. Seconds later, witnesses say that the couple started wrestling and grappling with each other. The young woman wasn't finished yet. She grabbed the man's arm and collar and started screaming, thief, drawing the attention of everyone nearby. Three shoppers and store clerks who saw the man tussling over a wallet with a young woman holding a baby assumed the man must be some sort of criminal and quickly apprehended him. The woman broke free while the man fought hard against his attackers. In the end, he had crushed three of his plastic cash cards in his hand. The shoppers tackled him to the floor and then called the police. Luckily, two young, inexperienced police officers who were arresting a shoplifter nearby were already at the scene to provide assistance. They handcuffed the elderly man and forced him to lie down on the ground, despite his protests and pleas of innocence. Then, to everyone's surprise, they noticed that the young woman had just 
disappeared. Meanwhile, the man was pressed to the floor with a policeman on top of him for a grueling 20 minutes. Despite his advanced age, when he tried to rise up from the ground, the police would force him back down. Eyewitnesses at the scene reported that one policeman was so aggressive that he broke the lenses of the victim's glasses and caused him to groan in a very unusual way. As a result, the man soon began vomiting and lost consciousness. But the 25-year-old policeman who had arrested him refused to take the handcuffs off or even take notice of his dire circumstances. More police officers eventually arrived at the scene and witnessed the way that this man was being handled. They finally helped him up and called for an ambulance. But unfortunately, by that time, it was too late. The dangerously high blood pressure caused by the stress of the situation and the subsequent police brutality led to arrhythmia and heart failure. His brain shut down and he passed away the next day. Shockingly, the day after his death, without any testimony from the mysterious woman or any concrete evidence, the police unashamedly filed charges against the deceased man. However, fortunately, some within the police force became suspicious about this woman's involvement. They investigated the CCTV footage at the ATM corner and determined that the man was completely innocent. In 2005, a year after the incident, the police released two low-quality images of the woman captured from the CCTV footage to the public. This move was not common in Japan and had not been done since the infamous Glyco case. Unfortunately, due to the poor quality of the images and the woman's almost inhumane facial features, the public began calling her a monster or a phantom. Releasing the images a year after the incident significantly reduced the likelihood of finding the woman or any evidence related to this crime. There was this woman who was carrying a baby on her chest, probably around two to three years old. People estimated her age to be between 25 and 30, and they thought that she was Japanese. She was not very tall, about 155 to 160 centimeters, and had brown hair that fell to her shoulders. Now, here's the weird part. Many people who saw her said that her face was very unusual. Some even went as far as saying that it didn't even look human. During the incident, she was wearing dark clothes and despite handling the man's cash cards, she left no fingerprints at the scene at all. She screamed thief at the man, but weirdly didn't say anything else to anyone else. The strangest thing was that she wasn't caught on any other CCTV footage at all, on any of the exits of the Just Go shopping center or anywhere else. It was as if she just simply vanished into thin air. After seeing the CCTV footage, it's hard to believe that it took the police seven long years until March of 2011 to finally acknowledge that this man was not a criminal. This meant that for all those years, the man's reputation was badly tarnished with a false charge, which is taken way more seriously in Japan than it is in the West. To make matters worse, this date is also significant because it was just one month after the statute of limitations had passed for this theft. This meant that the police wouldn't investigate the case any further or even try to find out who this woman was. The bereaved family was so upset with the police's unprofessionalism that they took them to court. Even though the police recognised that they had made the mistakes, they claimed that they did not use excessive force and that the arrest of the man did not cause his death. To make matters worse, the family was originally only paid a measly 125 yen as compensation for the death in May of 2011. That's just under $100. However, the Nagoya High Court ordered the police to pay 350,000 yen for, to put it mildly, their errors. Despite the circumstances of this incident, the authorities have never publicly apologised to this family. As for the creepy phantom woman, well, she's never been seen again. The police never really made much of an effort to find her, other than releasing the images and printing some posters to be placed in the local area. They never even got the images professionally edited or made illustrations based on eyewitness accounts, which is actually standard practice for Japanese police forces. Unfortunately, unless she comes forward herself, I doubt that she'll ever be found. So that's it for this video, folks. I wish you well and hope you have a great week. Stay safe out there and remember, no matter what life throws at you, keep smiling.